few years back, we did a project in order to determine whether or not corn silage could be a part of a profitable feeder lamb nutrition program. And I still hear sometimes producers asking questions about it, so I decided to put this video together uh, to hopefully reach a few more people. So what we did is we fed either no corn silage at all, 25% corn silage on a dry matter basis, or 50% corn silage on a dry matter basis. And the ingredients we substituted for that would have been corn and mixed grain, which of course is oats and barley. We used an off-the-shelf protein supplement from Floridale Feed Mill uh, for the 0% corn silage, but we had to increase the protein levels a little bit in for the 50% corn silage diet because of the protein loss that, uh, from the not having the mixed grains in there. And again, we wanted to target a, a similar crude protein level across all three treatments. Of course, in the 25% corn silage uh, treatment would have been a half the protein supplement from uh, this uh, from the 0% and half from the 50%. And as you can see right at the top, uh, just looking at the cost per ton of these feeds, the cost for the corn silage treatment was considerably cheaper uh, than, uh, than feeding a full grain diet. And these prices were prices at the time of when the trial occurred. This is the barn that we did the project in. The project was, uh, this was one of the early projects we did. So we had half cement bunks, half were wood bunks at that time. And uh, the pens were about uh, 16 foot wide and about uh, 20 foot long. And we had enough bunk space for all the lambs to be able to feed at the same time. I tried as much as possible to get students involved in our project. So this is a group of students that were involved in that one. And uh, I think it's good for their learning. They get to see different things, how and get to measure feed intakes and so forth very closely, watch the animals very closely. And, and of course, uh, it, it also helps with all the, the labor of, of doing a project like this. Here you can see the feeding that we did. Uh, right here you'd see the, high, the grain when it was first put in. Uh, this would be the corn silage when it was first put in. And you can see after time the grain was eaten down to this level and the, the corn silage treatment would be eaten down to that level. We, we tried to feed for a 5% refusal every day. If we look at the uh, lamb weights over the different weeks that the trial went on, you can see that the 0% and the 25% corn silage treatments, they grew basically at the same rate. The 25% might have been slightly lower, but all in all, they, they tended to keep fairly well up with the, the lambs going all the way through that were on the high grain diet. Whereas you can see that the ones on the 50% corn silage, especially by about week three, four, they really kind of fell off and were unable to keep up their growth rates as, they, as was able to happen with the higher grain diets. If we look at that in table form, it, their lambs were about 70% before we could start collecting the data and that's just because from the time we get them in, at that time we were still buying them from uh, Sale Barn, we had uh, someone helping us with that. And uh, by the time you get them in, get them transitioned and, and ready to go, uh, that they were a little bit heavier. Well, I'd like to start at about 60 pounds. And they land up going on average at 105 pounds uh, would have, again, liked to keep them for an extra week, but uh, that was just how it worked out for being able to get them into the meat lab to get the analysis done in them there as well. When we look at the average daily gain over this time, though, you can see uh, the, uh, they grew the 0% corn silage grew at about 0.71 pounds per day. And then the uh, ones on the 25% corn silage, very similar. When you see two letters like that, the little sub superscript AA across the treatments like that, that it tells you that those two are not significantly different. Whereas this one here is a B, it was significantly different from the other two in this case. And, and, and exactly, the 50% the corn silage lambs grew slower. They were not unable to keep up, and we saw that on the previous table as well. If we look at the feed intake across the whole trial for these ones, these guys, it consumed about 3.1 pounds, about 2.99 pounds again. There was not a significant uh, difference between those two treatments. However, the feed intake for the 50% uh, corn silage ones was significantly lower uh, feed intake. And uh, the feed intake on an as-fed basis, this probably, may, I mean, it should make sense. The more corn silage you have in there, the more feed there's gonna be because there's more water in it. Uh, corn silage is about 65% water, and so we can see that, yes, they did eat more feed. However, most of that in additional feed, of course, they ate was water. As a matter of fact, it all was water, simply because we, if we look at the dry matter basis, you see it actually reduced. This days to market number is not an actual number. It's a calculated number. I had made the assumption if the lambs gained 50 pounds, how long would it take them to do at these various growth rates? And it would take these guys about 70 days, about these guys about 75 days, 
uh, probably very similar again because these two numbers were not significantly different. Um, but then if we looked at the 50% corn silage, it would take about 109 days. You know, that's 25, 35 days longer. Uh, that, that's quite a bit longer time to, to go to market. And then the feed to gain ratio, okay, how much feed it takes to get a, how many pounds of feed to get a pound of gain or how many kilograms of feed to get a kilogram of gain. Uh, you can see 4.43, 4.54, again, not different, but this one here, considerably higher uh, feed to gain ratio, much less efficient. So even though that feed was so much cheaper, okay, the actual feed cost per pound of gain, uh, you can see it was about 70 cents per pound about 69 cents per pound for these guys but about 88 cents a pound for these fellows over here so you could took considerably more money to get them to go to market if we, again we calculate out a uh, this cost to gain 50 pounds we're talking about 35 dollars 34 dollars for this one and it would be 40 almost 44 dollars for these fellows over here so considerably more expensive to get these guys up to market even though the fee's cheaper because that's lower growth rate and less efficient growth that we see here it'll end up being uh not profitable to feed lambs at a 50% inclusion rate for corn silage. And by the way, just to, to clarify, because that's a question I would get from time to time, this corn silage was processed and it was a low lignin corn. Okay, so it was a highly more digestible corn silage and it went through a, a kernel processor, so it was broken into smaller pieces. So if any corn silage should have been successful with these lambs, this corn silage should have, should have and, and in fact it was not. If we look at the diets, we were able to, we targeted 16.4, uh, I think we targeted 16%, but we got 16.4% crude protein across the board uh, for the diets. And you can see that the total digestible nutrients, the amount of energy in the feed, decreased with more corn silage. And again, that makes sense. What did we substitute for the corn silage? Corn grain and mixed grain, which both have a higher energy levels. So the more we put in, the less energy there would be in those diets. I'd like to move on now to talk about some of the uh, carcass measurements and some of the things that we measured with that. Before we get to the data, I just want to briefly explain uh, what uh, the GR uh, measurement is. You may have heard of the GR measurement, girth rib measurement. It's a measurement between the 12th and 13th ribs, so from the back to the 12th, uh, from the front, sorry, going to the back, 12th, 13th ribs, and we measure 11 centimeters from the midline. And the knife has a little kind of measuring scale on it that when you put the knife in, you can measure the amount of fat tissue depth. And so that girth rib measurement will simply be a measurement of the fat at that level right there. So what did we get when we look? So do, just to explain this table a little bit, these are the statistical difference numbers over here. Basically, the lower this number is, the more statistically significant it is. I declared significance at 0 0.1. Um, that's not necessarily a magic number. Some people go 0 0.05. Uh, you, can, you can choose uh, the, where you declare your significance to be. Um, certainly though, if you see a number like 0 0.89, that's getting closer to one. The highest you could get would be, theoretically would be a one, and that would be completely no significant. That, that in fact, that, what that would mean is that there was no treatment effect on the heart, hot carcass weight. So the fact that this number is extremely high tells you that, that there was absolutely no impact of treatment on there. We also had either use or weathers. And so uh, I, we measured that. And I might discuss it a little bit, but I'm not going to get into a little, whole lot of time talking about the, the, the gender differences just because most of the differences that we were interested in was the corn, level of corn silage in the diet. Dressing percentage also, again, not different between the tr treatments. Again, the dressing, dressing percentage would be the amount of uh, carcass there was after the animal has uh, been cleaned, all the organs are out of it, and the wool is off. The shrink percent, that would be how much it shrunk in the day, the, the day one that it cooled. And again, there was no significant difference due to diet because of that. Here you can see the number that, uh, that we're talking about here in terms of the GR and millimeters. The 0% corn silage had a 22.5 millimeter uh, measurement. The 25% was had a, the letters AB, which means it's not different from this number or not different from this number. But in this case, these two numbers are significantly different. The 0% and the 50% corn silage numbers are different. And so you can see that there was less fat on the 50% corn silage lambs. And this was significant. There was a significant difference there. That tells me again that probably there, well, it just says that at that point there was less fat on them. If we looked at the back fat, at another measurement of back fat, uh, it was not significant in this case. You can see it was kind of close. And again, numerically, you can see kind of the same trend as we saw over here. 
This is interesting because another way we can talk about fat is the marbling, and that's the fat that's interspersed within the meat, and that's usually the, the, we think about that in terms of flavor and tenderness and so forth. And so the uh, higher number in this case would be a good thing, and we saw actually that the treatment did not have an impact on marbling. This would be, so it looks like maybe the difference in fat levels was mostly uh, a back fat level issue. If we look at the total loin, okay, again, there's no difference in terms of the total weight of the loin, no difference in the loin lean. A loin fat, again, not significantly different, uh, but again, this number kind of matches up with what we saw on the previous screen. And then the loin eye area, again, there was no difference across the treatments for this one either. Some other meat quality measurements we took. The, uh, if you look here, you can see the pH at 24 hours. Again, uh, there's no difference due to the diet. There was a, a small difference due to gender, and I had those numbers down here, 5.55 versus 5.58. I, I doubt that that is a biologically significant, even though it might be statistically significant difference. Uh, I, I would be surprised that that would be a biologically significant number. The other thing we did is we measured the color, and so the camera that can measure color and lightness, and again, we found no difference due to treatment, due to, to the lightness. The red-green colors, we saw no difference. We did see a difference between, the, again, the 0% and the 50% on the blue-yellow um, color difference. Uh, we saw a difference there. I, I talked to the meat scientist about this, and he said, again, this difference, though there, it may be statistical, mathematically st significant difference is probably not a biologically significant difference. No human would be able to detect that difference between those two colors. Again, there were some gender differences, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail to talk about, to talk about th those in, at this point in time. Another thing that uh, we were able to measure is the shear force. And uh, let me just kind of explain how this piece of equipment works. And if you're a meat scientist, you might cringe at my explanation of it. But basically, you, you, you cut a core of meat, a round core of meat, and you set it in this machine. And there's a knife that comes down. And the knife will come down at a, a set speed coming down. And how much pressure it takes to cut that meat will then uh, be the shear force. The more tender the meat is, the less force it takes to, to cut it. So it's kind of a... Uh, a measurement of the tenderness of that piece of meat. Now we have that we it was done at two days, at five days, and at eight days. And so here you can see the averages with the standard uh, error uh, with it uh, of, of each of the numbers as well. As far as the statistics went on this one, we used live weight as what we call a covariate. That means we said uh, whatever the weight was when the animal died is going to be they're going to be corrected for that weight. Because the 50% corn silage ones were a little bit lighter in general when they went for slaughter, we wanted to be able to correct for that. Although you can see that that impact didn't actually impact across, because none of these were significant, did not actually impact the, um, the tenderness of, of the meat at the, for the treatments and across the different days there. You can see again a little bit of a difference here for a gender on day two, but as we move up here to day five and day eight, there was a difference due to diet. And again, you can see that these ones took a little bit more force. The 4.34 versus 3.21 um, took more force. There was no difference between these, but you can see again, there's a trend. Uh, I, I, would, I would say that you can see kind of a linear uh, a line there. And same with the, the eight days, it got uh, tougher. And again, there was a significant difference between the the lambs at 50% um, corn silage versus the lambs at eight that were at 0% uh, corn silage at the tenderness at eight days. Now, I, I made this next slide to kind of explain that. And again, it's, it is a generalization of how it works, but I think, it's a, I think it's a fairly good explanation of it. Anytime you have growth going on in, a, in an animal, you have what's called anabolism. Anabolism is the, the actual growth, but at the same time, you always have catabolism going on as well. And so the catabolism... Uh, and, and, any, and as anabolism goes higher and higher and higher, so does catabolism. It goes as up as well. Just it doesn't go up as fast, and therefore the green part, you can see the growth of the animal, it gets larger and larger. So the, generally, in general, the faster an animal's growing, okay, the more, and of course, the more anabolism it's going to have, but also the more catabolism that's going to be going on. And why does this become important when we and when we go back and look at that uh, that previous slide and we see that the ones that were growing higher tended to be faster, tended to be more tender? Well, when I slaughter that animal, okay, when I slaughter the animal, and let's say it's at this point right here, I have one animal that's right here and I have one animal that's over here, okay, down here at this point. It, once I slaughter them, the anabolism stops, okay, they don't grow anymore. However, the catabolism in lambs can continue for about a week. 
pay. Mm -hmm. They'll continue at least at a, at a significant rate uh, for up to a week. And so that in the sac catabolism, that tenderizes that meat. It breaks down some of those tougher proteins and proteins that are going to be harder to chew and so forth. And so the faster that animal is growing, the faster the catabolism, which means after a week you're going to have a higher amount of those proteins broken down and the animal is going to be more tender. This is one of the reasons why too if you're going to cull an old ewe, if you can put her to feed for the last maybe week or two before she's slaughtered, before you send her off, she will gain some, if she can gain some weight as long as that weight is muscle growth not just fat, you can actually make her a little bit more tender. So in general, the quicker they're growing, the more tender they're going to be and we saw that in, in this particular trial. Another question people might be wondering about is what impact does the corn silage have on feed intake? So we did, I just plotted the numbers across here and this is a feed intake by a week. And again, you can see feed intake was relatively constant for the 0 and 25 and it was lower for the 25% the uh, inclusion uh, diet. So what I tried to do is I tried to develop some equations to be able to predict this. And when I did that, once I take into account the actual weight of the animal, can keep it in mind that, that in that previous slide, those ones that the grow the feed intake was slower for those corn silage ones, that corresponded with their weight being also lighter. If we would shift it over so that they're at the same weights, there was very little differences between the different treatments in terms of their ability to feed intake. It's so much so that I really don't think that it's uh, probably worth worrying about. Uh, I, I say that your shovel's probably not accurate enough to measure the difference that you might see. So I did develop this equation here to predict feed uh, dry, dry matter intake based on the feed body weight of the animal. Um, I wouldn't put a whole, whole lot of confidence in this. I mean, it, the equation works. I think it's fine. However, I think just as a safe rule of thumb, if you start at 3.5% of body weight and then just use bunk management practices after that, I think you're going to be doing well. And so again, you weigh the total number of lambs. you got 100 lambs in a pen, add up all their weights together, take 3.5% of that, and that would be a good place to start in terms of feed intake for those lambs. After that, you can decide whether you want to feed, for example, 5% refusals or if you want it to be slick bunk, whatever the case is. Now you can manage that. Some additional notes that I think are very important. Uh, we had four lambs on that 50% corn silage treatment that died. One had a rectal prolapse. Three of them died of listeriosis. And, and to me, this is this basically, this, in my opinion, this is a game changer for using corn silage. So listeria is a bacteria that's very common in our soils and so forth. And it thrives in warm environments and also thrives in um, moist environments and uh, in, in oxygen rich environments. So when we put our feed in our, our silages in our silos, we try to get rid of the, there's of course gonna be moisture and depending on the time of year, there could be heat in there. And so we have to do a really good job of getting the oxygen out of there. And that's why we pack bung silos and that's why we try to fill silos as quickly as possible. And that's why we have to remove so much feed every day because the oxygen will start allowing this bacteria to take over. So it's often a, it's often a bacteria we think about when we're talking about feed spoilage. And uh, it basically, uh, the bacteria gets into the brain of the animals and it causes circling disease where you see them circling. And uh, fairly quickly it turns into them laying down that they can't get back up and they'll paddle and, and it will kill them. If you catch it early enough, you can't treat it with antibiotics, but you have to be right on it to catch it. Uh, and and your time, the time frame is, is relatively small. So if you're going to be feeding a corn silage diet, you, you're going to have to spend more effort and more thought on your management uh, for that. Harvesting in the first place to make sure you don't get soil contamination into your, into your feed. Storage, again, making sure you get as much oxygen out as possible. Make sure you remove the correct amount of feed. For example, bunk silo, you should be removing six inches a day to stay ahead of that spoilage. And then bunk management. Your bunks have to be cleaned out, I would say, at least once a day uh, in cold weather and twice a day in warmer weather. They have to be completely cleaned out because that feed spoilage will increase the risk of, of listeriosis. So the question comes is, would I feed corn silage? Uh, probably not. However, I'm going to say maybe. Maybe if I, maybe around 25% inclusion, we saw no difference between the 0% and the 25%. And so I could have, for example, if I wanted to slow lambs down, the next slide, I'm going to talk about this a little bit. If I wanted to slow lambs down, basically background them for a little bit in order to be able to uh, hit a later market, okay? Um, the other thing I would need to have is I'd already have to have a system in place to do so. I'm not going to be buying silos or ag bags or a, a mixing cart or anything like that for feeding lambs. However, if I'm already feeding my ewes like that, then maybe I would decide to feed a little bit of corn silage as well. I really don't think though it's worth decreasing automation over. It's much easier to automate systems when you're feeding grain than it is to feed with uh, 
uh, corn silage or forages, uh, or wet forages, I should say, silages. And so I, I, I this is probably a, one of the big reasons why I wouldn't do it labor. Um, if I was going to do it, I'd like to keep some beef cattle around for cleanup. Beef cattle can get listeriosis as well, but they're much less susceptible to it. And so if I was going to clean up my bunk twice a day, I could then throw the refusals to them and they could clean that up. And at least I don't waste as much feed. Maybe instead of feeding for 5% refusals, then I feed for 10% refusals. And uh, that will help those lambs be able to uh, have fresh, clean feed in front of them for longer and more for a longer period of time. But it'll, the, the flip, and then I can feed that to the, to the those beef animals so that it doesn't get wasted. Let me show you just some calculations where an example where it might be uh, beneficial to do this. Let's say I brought in some lambs. So let's say we have a late uh, a late Easter. Uh, the particular year, I, I looked at an actual year when I was doing this calculation and uh, Easter was shortly after April 18 that year, so fairly late, late Easter. And let's say I bought in some 70 pound lambs on February 1st and I could and I raised them on the three diets to 110 pounds. If I was going to do that, uh, these guys would be ready to go to market at 0% corn silage on March 22. These guys would be a couple days later, March 25th, and these guys would be quite a bit later at April 18. If I look at my feed costs, based on how we did the calculation earlier, $24, $24, these guys are going to be almost $31 for feed costs, considerably higher than these ones over here. Uh, $6, a little more than $6 more expensive. And then, uh, but then if we look at the actual value of that lamb at the end date, these guys would have gone to market before uh, the Easter market. Uh, was really starting to heat up. It was, it was coming up a little bit, but it hadn't really heated up yet. And so therefore they made about $10 less than if I was able to sell them on that uh, later date of April 18th. And yes, I, I'm losing $6 in terms of feed here. However, I'm gaining $10. So I'm still about $4 ahead by, by slowing them down. So in that situation, again, I think that if you want to slow animals down, uh, then it may be an appropriate uh, system to use. Again, as long as your death loss could be kept under control. If you don't keep that death loss under control, uh, you have two, three lambs die, all the, this gain in six, this $4 gain per lamb, uh, you know, that's $400 uh, that you're saving on 100 lambs, and you lose two lambs, you've just lost all that money back again. So again, as long as you can keep that death loss under control, I, I think feeding corn silage can be profitable, um, but in, uh, in, as a general rule, I would say no. I, I would not feed, I would not set up a feed system where I feed corn silage to my lambs. A nice uh, thing when we did the project, uh, we had someone from Ontario Farmer come out and uh, and we're able to uh, showcase what we've done and what we're working with students. So it's always neat to have that. And I think it's a good opportunity for the students to be able to work with. I would like to acknowledge the funders of this pro the project. Ontario Sheep Farmers gave funding for it. And special thanks also to Wicked Thorn Farms and Floridale Feed Mill for their contributions to help us complete this project.